Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this another Lord's Day. We thank Thee for uh, the fact that this is the day of all the week, the best emblem of eternal rest, and that Thou hast uh, set this day apart from all the rest, first of all, unto Thy service, for it is a holy day, and holiness, the essence of holiness being uh, reserved and set apart unto thy service as we are thy holy people we as Israel of old have been set apart unto thy service and we thank thee also that this day is not only set apart unto thy service but it is set apart for the benefit of thy people for the sanctification of thy people for the edification of thy people so that we pray that we that thou wouldst sanctify us uh, through thy truth, for thy word is truth. We th we pray for this uh, country. We pray that we would be able to continue to proclaim the truth uh, freely. And we pray for uh, the dissemination of the truth throughout the entire world. For we know that thou art the God of all the earth. So we pray that thou be with us, speak to us, uh, increase our faith. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are looking at um, Hebrews 11 and verse 10, and let's begin with verse 9 again. By faith, he, meaning Abraham, sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise for he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God I hope all of us are rejoicing in the things we've been discussing for the past few weeks um, because I see it to be very encouraging very wond wondrous and the profundity of these things for us to meditate on is um, more than words could express. Uh, and we have been considering, first of all, just by way of review, we've been considering uh, in verse 9 the fact that Abraham and all those who are heirs of the same promise, which includes us, uh, Abraham sojourned uh, and he sojourned living in tabernacles and the all importance of this that we uh, as we I think we mentioned yesterday we we use the things of this world with a with, with a light grip that's just another instance of this same concept that we we're we though we live on the earth we are not denizens of this earth we are denizens of the kingdom of heaven and just think of, I was thinking in my preparation of the importance that the media places on physical beauty. Just meditate on that. Uh, and he, here's one a facet of it. You can't be a model for more than like 15 years because you're too old to be one. Um, beauty is so fleeting. And so... Uh, if you're taking up permanent residence in this place, you're in for a rude awakening. Because as we said yesterday, um, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of nobody else does. So the concept of, of sojourning, which is so important, not only to Abraham, but, but all of his descendants by faith which is the topic at hand secondly we talked about the importance of the promise note carefully this is not a promise this is the promise the promise which all of us by faith grasp latch on to receive and the concept of recumbency remember that word that's a fantastic word all of us should be familiar with arresting on remember that him we used to sing in the Baptist, standing on the promises. That's recumbency. The promise 
that all things, even the bad things that we experience in this life, work together for our final glorification. And that is only because we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Proverbs, uh, excuse me, Psalm 1, verse 2, uh, well, beginning with verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, I used to think that this was talking about the Ten Commandments, but it is not, although it includes that. In his law, in God's system, in God's a way of looking at things, in God's gospel, we meditate... We meditate on the promise, this blessed hope which awaits us. And think about this, that um, this is a very good uh, prospect of meditation. All the problem of problems that you have, all the anxieties that you have, all the depressions that come your way, there is one cause and one cause alone for all of these things, and that is sin. And so, uh, the promise given to us in Christ is that the, the, the origin of all of our troubles is going to be done away with. For we shall, in our final glorification, we shall be delivered from the very presence of sin. I think of that old hymn, Oh, to sit with Mary at the Master's feet. Be this my happy choice, my one, my one delight, my only bliss, my joy, my heaven on earth be this, to hear the bridegroom's voice. Thirdly, we talked about the word for. For he looked for a city which hath foundations. The importance of this word once again in Psalm 1-2. In his law doth he meditate day and night. In his system, in God's way. And we think once again of the words of Thomas. Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? The, 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 the way as uh, revealed in scripture is a rational way. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. There are only two services in the universe, the service of God and the service of Satan. And the devil is fine with you. He's not going to bother you at all as long as you don't resist his service. But once you do, as the Israelites did of old, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. And then what did Pharaoh, who is a representative of the, of the devil, what did he do? He commanded them to make the same, to produce the same level of bricks without straw. And so it is with the enemy of souls, Satan. You show me a person who's seeking to be delivered from the clutches of, of the devil and darkness then he will increase your load. Um, this goes against uh, Psalm 1 and 2 because it's irrational. The service of Satan is totally, completely irrational. Um, he, he chews you up and spits you out, as it were. Take, take the, this monster uh, which Satan uses and is is using at this present time this monster of antinomianism the church we attended whose pastor we discovered uh, when we were there was an antinomian for he made this statement the law of God is and must be an incidental concern to the Christian for Christ has fulfilled it on his behalf that's the essence of antinomianism how rational was his life well he had begun, at the time we were there, a 10-year uh, adulterous relationship. 10 years. Uh, 
His daughter became a whore. His son robbed a gun store and also committed adultery with a member of the church. Sound like a rational service to you? Fourthly, last week we talked about the concept of seeking. I thought about this afterwards, or I would have mentioned it last year, excuse me, last week. And while we were speaking of the importance of seeking the Lord while he may be found, a vast majority of people in the church were on an Easter egg hunt. How do you like that? Put those two things together. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and unto our God for he will abundantly pardon. And then we saw yesterday, Jeremiah 29, 13, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. There is none that seeketh after God. And yet, God in commanding his people. Think about this also. This is the essence of the effectual call. Look at the Apostle Paul. He was doing the very opposite of seeking God. He was seeking to destroy God, to destroy God's kingdom. And yet the effectual call. Oh, why kickest thou again? Who art thou, Lord? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's the proclamation of the law of God. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Oh, yes. And so, God's command, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for broad is the way, for straight, for uh, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You can go into the, you can enter the wide gate any old way. Not so the narrow gate. The straight gate in the narrow way. Few there be that find it. And we saw Isaiah 65. Um, I am a uh, I am sought of them that ask not after me. I am found of them that sought me not. That's the real, uh, and that's the real paradox as opposed to the false, the fake paradoxes of the Calvinists. And then we looked at Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Just to show how important, because, I mean, I, I very seldom if ever hear about this, the importance of this concept of seeking the Lord. A Christian, no, we don't call ourselves Calvinists. We call ourselves what God calls us. And one of the major things that he calls us, especially in the book of Psalms, and the older you get as a Christian, the more you appreciate the book of Psalms. No question about that. What, what, what does God call us? He calls us those who seek His face. Listen to these. Just a few of the passages. Psalm 9, Psalm 9, 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. A Christian, one who seeks after God. Listen to the antithesis in Psalm 10, 4. The wicked, through the, proud, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That's the antithesis. We are those who do seek after God. Not so the wicked. Psalm 24, 6. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalm 27, 8. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 34, 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want 
any good thing. Psalm 40, 16. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Did you notice that one? He parallels seeking the Lord with loving God's salvation. In other words, you don't seek the Lord if you don't love his salvation and everything that is antithetical to it. We may add. Psalm 63, 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Psalm 69, 6. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Psalm, 90, Psalm 69, 6. Let... Uh, I just read that one. Psalm 69, 32. The humble shall see this and be glad. And your heart shall live that seek God. No coincidence that that's the last one on our list. Listen, listen to that one. Your heart shall live that seek God. See that? You, you don't live because you seek God. It's the same exact concept. Uh, I am found, I am found of them that sought me not. You only seek God as a result of, well, look at what we, what, what, what did we look at yesterday in Galatians? The same exact idea. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather, are known of God. We seek God because we are found of God. And it, we have every reason to believe that even in heaven, we will still be seeking as the angels do now. The angels look, un, look into the plan of God's salvation of His people. Now, um, as we said that seeking is synonymous with the Christian life, let's just um, flesh that out a little bit. We find God, do we not? We seek and find God in the doctrine of total depravity. We seek and find God in the doctrine of unconditional election. We find God in the doctrine of limited atonement. We find God in the doctrine of irresistible grace. And we find God, yes, in the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. Um, I was thinking also of, in, in, in this concept that we constantly mention, uh, of metaphors in the physical realm, Metaphors in the natural realm with spiritual implications. How about this one with regard to seeking? Where does God put gold? Does he put it on top of the ground? No, he puts it in the ground so that you have to seek it to find it. And so it is with the Christian life. Um, I was reading a theologian, this was well, 25 years ago or so. He said, God doesn't save lazy people. Do you think... He said God would, God would despise his salvation if he gave it to lazy people like you. No. God doesn't despise his salvation. And so he grants his salvation to those who seek him. In such a way that you will never, if you understand the concept of seeking, he, he, he crowns them. He rewards them. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. But He rewards us in such a way that if we understand this, we will never take credit for the seeking ourselves. How amazing that is. Today we're going to look at yet another concept in verse 10 and that is what the author says. He looked for a city which hath foundations. The concept of a foundation is also all important. 
And all of these five concepts, the concept of, of um, sojourning, the concept of God's promise, which was given to Abraham, the promise of Christ. Abraham wasn't promised Isaac. He was promised Christ through Isaac. The concept of our seeking and our, the Christian life being a rational one, as represented by the word for. And then last week, the concept of seeking. This week, um, we are going to be looking at the concept of the fact that we, our dwelling, has a foundation. Not only are these concepts super important, but they are also, as we have discovered, very integrally related one to the other. Um, sojourning. We sojourn because of the promise, because of the promise that it's not a promise in the natural realm. It's in the spiritual realm. And then it's, it's a rational seeking. No, we don't go for these fake paradoxes that though God is determined from the foundation of the world only to save some, yet when the gospel is preached, he desires the salvation of all men. No, no, no. Our, our service of God is a rational service. So the word for. And we seek God. Because of the promise, which necessitates our sojourning. And then lastly today, what we're going to be pointing out is this. We seek something that's really there. Nobody else does. Show me a natural man and I'll show you a man who's seeking something that isn't there. Not so with the Christian life. Because there's a foundation. Think about, I was thinking about, I think I mentioned him last week, Warren Buffett. I read recently that he's been living in the same house, though this guy is worth like, what, $80 billion? He's been living in the same house for like 50 years. Let's just suppose he, he did something every year for the last 50 years to fortify the house that he's living in. Yet the house he's living in has no foundation because he's going to be leaving it very soon. Not so with a Christian life. For other foundation, 1 Corinthians 3.11 tells us, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And here's something to meditate on as well. What is, not only is Christ, this very foundation, what was the sustenance of the Israelite sojourners in the wilderness? What was the manna? The manna was Christ. What was the rock from which the water flowed in the wilderness? The rock was Christ. What was the promise? The promise, as we just said, to Abraham in the context of this passage, was not Isaac. The promise was Christ through Isaac. What is the reason for everything we do? As a Christian, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's the purpose of language? The purpose of language is coming to an understanding of the truth, a rational understanding of the truth. The reason, as represented by the word for, we all know, as we, we hear every year, um, the statement, Jesus is the reason for the season. You ask 99% of people who say that, well then, if Jesus is the reason for the season, what's the reason behind saying that Jesus dies for all men and some people still go to hell? And then they immediately skip over to the season. There is no reason in their religion. So what are we seeking? We are seeking this foundation which is Christ himself. And why is that? The faith of Thomas tells us, Lord, we know not 
whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Everyone's going to stand before the judge, before God has judged, Elohim. But no man cometh unto the Father but by me, for Christ is the only foundation. There is no Father outside of Christ. And before we uh, get further into this concept of foundation, we see in this verse, he looked for a city that had foundations. Then we look in verse 14, it says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, a city that hath foundations, a country. And then we're told in Galatians that we are to, to do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Country, city, household. So, before we get to this concept of a foundation, we can't ignore the fact that, 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 that of what we were just saying, a city, a country, a household, what we're, we're told is that the Christian is to have a dwelling place. And uh, let me just read this because we were raised in the West and the place where I live is the Far East. And the Far East, rationally speaking, is a lot closer to the Middle East, the Jewish culture, than the West is. Here's the importance in the East and the Middle East. The importance of residence. The importance of a dwelling place. We have what, what they say in Chinese, the Huko system. Listen to this. Huko is a system of household registration in mainland China and Taiwan. The, the oldest civilization that we know of on earth is the Chinese civilization. Although the system itself is more properly called Huji and has origins in ancient China. A household registration record officially identifies a person as a resident of an area and includes identifying information such as name, parent, spouse, and date of birth. A huko can also refer to a family register in many contexts since the household registration record uh, is issued per family and usually includes the births, deaths, marriages, divorces, and moves of all members in the family. This concept of huko is basically foreign to Western thinking because we think independently. They don't. The importance of a dwelling place. You, are, you have, from a certain standpoint, you have identification owing to the place that you belong to. And so we have here the importance of household, city, country. Christ... In John 14, as we just uh, mentioned, verse 6, but in the very first verse, he says, I go to prepare a place for you, a dwelling place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Think about the concept of the gospel call. It is calling us from some place to another place, calling us, giving, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, from one dwelling place to another dwelling place, from one kingdom unto another kingdom. Today, uh, Primarily, we're dealing with, once again, this concept of the fact that Abraham looked for a city that had a foundation. Recently, somebody asked me this question. He said, is regeneration the gospel? And what's the answer to that? Most definitely. Regeneration is the gospel as seen from the 
standpoint of the third person of the Blessed Trinity. Is election the gospel? Of course it is. It's the gospel as seen from the standpoint of the first person of the Trinity. Many people, many Calvinists say, oh no, election, we can't say election is, is the gospel because they know too many people that, don't, that they want to call Christians who don't believe in election. But election is the gospel. And then finally, is redemption the gospel? And of course, once again, it is the gospel as seen from the standpoint of the second person of the Trinity, which is what we're going to be looking at today. The gospel, the foundation, uh, as seen from the second person of the Trinity, which is the doctrine of redemption. For other foundation, there is no Christ is the foundation. Listen to this. The Father sent the Son. All that the Father giveth me, Christ said in John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. The Father sent the Son to be our foundation. And so we could say, that the foundation of the Christian life is laid, objectively speaking, by the Father. And the foundation is laid, subjectively speaking, by the Spirit. Think about that. Oh, yes. Subjectively speaking, this foundation, you don't lay this foundation, you don't even participate in the laying of this foundation. Objectively speaking, this foundation was laid by the Father. Subjectively speaking, what do we mean by that? This is what we mean by this. You only know there's a foundation by the work of the Holy Spirit in causing you to realize that you're the foundation that you sought to build from, your, from, from the moment you started breathing was a foundation of self-righteousness, which is no foundation. Laid objectively by the Father, laid subjectively by the Spirit, and to see this foundation is to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps the best passage by way of explanation of this is uh, Matthew 16, beginning with verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, this foundation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ said, Blessed art thou, Simon or Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. We always read it that way, but I think the best way to read the passage is, Blessed art thou. You are blessed and not cursed. That confession that just came out of your mouth is evidence, is the evidence of all evidences. That you are a person who's blessed, of, blessed is a man, there it is again, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, that doesn't have a foundation built on self-righteousness, that's the only other foundation there is, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The law, the method, the way of which Christ said he is, the only way to the Father. And so, Peter was pronounced blessed of God as opposed to being cursed. 
And um, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, of course, we know what they do with this statement. Upon this rock, verse 18, upon this, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So their church is built on the foundation of Peter uh, by their own words. Apostolic succession. Uh, and then, but, but, but a couple, a, a few verses later, Peter says, Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So, if your foundation is built upon man, which everybody's looking to build a foundation upon man, which is to say, and the main man is themselves. But to build a foundation upon man is to build a foundation upon Satan, which is what is exactly what Christ was saying there. Get thee behind me, Satan. His confession, which elicited Christ's response that he was blessed of God was a confession of Christ. That's why we vociferously and adamantly oppose referring to ourselves as Calvinists. That's an, just another instance, right? You're going to build your foundation on, upon Peter? You're going to build your foundation upon Calvin? No way. We love to follow man. So the Catholics are Peterists and the smart evangelicals are Calvinists. But the scripture calls us Christians. It calls us saints. It calls us elect. It calls us sheep. It calls us beloved. And as we just instanced, it calls us those who seek the face of God through Christ. Seekers of God. But that's not good enough for the Calvinists. They got to call themselves something else because they have to build their foundation on man. And so, the Christian life, the life of Abraham and all these men mentioned in Hebrews 11, they were given the same confession, the confession of a foundation. Our dwelling place, the, the foundation of our dwelling place is built on the Lord Jesus Christ, the only foundation. And so Christ is saying the very same thing. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, which leads us once again to Luke 6. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built an house and digged deep, the concept of searching again, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth. Notice once again, all these concepts are in this same passage. The concept of sojourning, building a foundation apart from anybody else's foundation. The concept of the promise. You are not going to even seek to build a foundation apart from the promise that God gives us. And the concept, most importantly today, of the fact that our foundation is built on Christ and Christ alone. And we want to take the rest of the time to look at perhaps the most important passage in all of Scripture concerning this concept of the Christian life being built on a foundation. Isaiah 28 Verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, 
a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. And the waters shall overflow the hiding place. First of all, notice uh, the relationship of this to everything we've been talking about over the past few months even. Did you notice in verse 16? Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. This series is located, if you look on Sermon Audio, under Isaiah 52, 7. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. That's what we're talking about. And once again, I think we pointed this out yesterday as well. Uh, when, when the servant of God preaches, if there's any, uh, if, if the... If the, if the hearers, if there is any number whatsoever, you're going to have goats among the sheep. And yet, we're not talking to the goats. We're talking to the sheep. Say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. We're, we'll deal with the goats in a few minutes, but we're talking whenever we preach the gospel. We are talking to the sheep. I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. Secondly, this passage, we might say, is the Old Testament expression of 1 Corinthians 3.11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Notice 1 Corinthians 3 says, other foundation can no man lay, then that is, it's already laid. But in Isaiah 28, it's speaking of the future, is it not? Behold, I lay, which is to say, I shall lay. When the Messiah comes, he is the foundation. Isaiah also tells us thirdly, that this stone upon which the foundation of the Christian life is laid is a tried stone. That's important too. A tried stone. He was tempted. Uh, Hebrews 4 tells us, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. That's what we're talking about. He's a tried stone. He was tried as we are. Thou art weighed in the balances. We see in the book of Daniel. He says to the king reading the writing on the wall. Many, many take you far sin. Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. But our foundation, that tried stone, that stone was tried and was not found wanting. He was tempted like as in all points, like as we are and yet without sin. Christ is a tried stone because he drank. If it, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But it didn't cup, but it did not pass from him. For he drank the cup of the wrath of God to its dregs. A tried stone. Secondly, Matthew 15, Matthew 5, 18 says, One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. He was tried with respect to that righteousness which God demands of every one of us, which none of us has. And yet Christ had it, produced it, and therefore is our foundation. Jeremiah 23, 6. This is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Our foundation. 
And fourthly, this passage tells us, he that believeth shall not make haste. That's an interesting, I think all of us will admit, that's kind of, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a, immediately apparent what he's talking about here. He that believeth on him shall not make haste. What is he talking about? Let's look at Romans 9.33 where this passage is referenced. In the New Testament, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed shall not make haste, shall not be ashamed. And then we see the same thing referenced in 1 Peter 2. Verse 6, Wherefore, also, it is contained in the Scripture, same passage, Isaiah 28, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded, shall not be ashamed, shall not make haste, shall not be confounded. Think about that concept of making haste. It's anxiety. He that believeth on him shall not be anxious. No. Why? Because he's a solid foundation. What is anxiety? It's worrying, is it not? It's sin. It's worrying that, well, this foundation that I'm saying, is it, is, is, it, is it solid or is it not? Is my life solid or is it not? I think all of us have walked over one time or another suspension bridges. I can't stand them uh, because I, I guess I have a fear of heights. But... What's, what's the fear there? What's the, what produces the anxiety? You feel the bridge moving under your feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? Because you're unmovable. Your life, your house as it were, being established on the one foundation, which is Christ. Lastly, in this passage in Isaiah 28, Isaiah tells us why we need a foundation. Well, Luke 6 just referred to, what did he say? And when the flood arose, the flood arose in both cases. Or the stream arose. And this stream against which our house must have a foundation is not, firstly, is, what is this? What is the need for this foundation? We need a foundation not because of the opinion of men. We're constantly being opposed. Strength against the opinion of men? No. Is it, a found, is it a foundation against low self-esteem or insecurity? Oh, look, we've got Walter Payton. We've got B.J. Tom. We've got Bob Dylan. How can we be? How can there be anything wrong with us? Christian insecurity. No. The stream, the flood, is the flood of God's wrath. That's what he's talking about. Can we prove that? Doesn't take very far. Verse 17. Our house must be built upon a foundation because the flood that will come in both cases, both with respect to the elect and with respect to the reprobate. The flood that will come is found in verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and the hail shall sweep away 
the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. The stream is the stream of God's wrath, which means that God demands a perfect righteousness, judgment. Also, will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet? The plummet doesn't lie. It goes straight down. God demands a perfect righteousness without which we shall be destroyed. And then, what is this refuge of lies he's talking about? And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. How current this is. A famous reformed denomination that almost no one would deny uh, is an eminent reformed, what shall we say, denomination is on record on their website as promoting the importance of self-esteem. Is, here's the title of the article, is self-esteem important for the Christian and how is it developed? That's self-esteem is the refuge of lies. That's what it is. What is, to speak in concrete terms, what is the redefinition of total depravity? The ubiquitousness of this redefinition of total... What is that? That's a refuge of lies. What is, the univer what is the concept of the universal love of God? God loves me, so he must love all men. The refuge of lies. What is the concept of universal atonement? Christ died for all men, and yet some men still go to hell. It's a refuge of lies. What is the concept that faith precedes regeneration? It's a refuge of lies. Refuge. You have it? You see it? Meditate on that. Think about that. The hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. You are seeking something apart from this one and only foundation. And there's only one other foundation that anyone has ever built. And that's self-righteousness. John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word. If you continue on this foundation. Then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. We've said it again and again. The truth in Scripture is the righteousness of Christ. The lie, which is to say the refuge of lies, is self-righteousness. Think about that. The false gospel, no matter what, if it's a Mormonism, Je uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, if it's Hinduism, if it's Shintoism, if it's Buddhism, it's built upon a refuge of lies. The lie of lies is that I'm basically a good person. You see self-esteem? You can't see self-esteem in that? And then finally, we said we're going to mention, because the passage, at least in 1 Peter 2, let's look back at that, mentions that the flood comes to both houses. Christ is not primarily sent with respect to the reprobate. Nevertheless, whatever happens to the reprobate is foreordained of God. I'll say that once again. Christ is not sent primarily with respect to the reprobate, but whatever happens to the reprobate, it happens according to the foreordination of God, the pleasure of God. 1 Peter 2, 6, we read that a second ago. Wherefore also, 
It is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. Their foundation is built on this refuge of lies. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even unto them which stumble at the word. Think about that. What do they stumble at? Do they stumble at the fact that the gospel is so sophisticated that only the elite mental magicians can come up with it? No, they stumble at the simplicity of the gospel. How simple it is. You are without the one thing God demands of us without which we shall be eternally destroyed. And that is a perfect righteousness. You have none of that which God demands of you. And the only location of it is in the Lord Jesus Christ who is the foundation for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this, another Lord's Day. We thank thee that as Abraham did, so do we. Look for a city. We look for a dwelling place. And this dwelling place is promised to, I go to, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. We thank thee that not only do we have a dwelling place, but we have the only foundation which can resist, which can give us a shelter in the time of storm which is the perfect unadulterated righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in his name we pray amen